So, this week, Hilary Mantel was named the winner of the £50,000 Man Booker Prize for Fiction for her novel, uh, Bring Up the Bodies, published by Fourth Estate. Um, it was unusual because it's the second in a trilogy, um, a trilogy about Thomas Cromwell and his dealings uh, with Henry VIII, uh, and no one has ever one for a trilogy, uh, for a second book in a trilogy before. Uh, she's also the first woman, the first Briton to win the prize twice, and only the third author to be a double winner alongside J.M. Coetzee and Peter Carey. So she's in rather stellar literary company. She's also, as I said, the first to win for two novels in a trilogy, which puts a, a lot of heat, I'd say, on the third installment. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Hilary Mantel. Hilary, welcome. Now, when you won uh, the first time round, you said that you were going to spend the prize money on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So I know we're all very interested to know what you did the other night when you won for the second time. <laughs> well, you know, the answer, I'm going to spend it paying my mortgage, is the real one, but not really acceptable to the press. Was it... Um, more or less exciting than your first win? I mean, I imagine that you really thought the odds were against you, not because the book wasn't great, but because uh, there, are very, there are no occasions of someone winning for a trilogy, so you probably thought that ruled you out. Did it make for a more pleasant evening? I think it was certainly a little more relaxed from our point of view than my first book, A Prize. But uh, we were too relaxed. And the chairman, you know, normally the chairman, he thinks he's gone into show business. And he says, the winner of the Man Booker Prize, whatever year, is. And then he does this long, long show business pause, <laughs> during which time your heart is in your mouth. Because, you know, if you've won, then Within a couple of minutes, you're going to be live on camera and you are going to plunge into media hell. But this year, the chairman was so brisk, he just popped up and announced it. One of my publishers didn't even hear it <laughs> and said, why is Hillary standing up? <laughs> I have not been so surprised for many years. It's, I did have faith in my book, it's not that. But you did think, I think we all felt that there might be an extra literary consideration here, in that it's only human to want to give a chance to a new author. And we had a couple of first novelists on the shortlist. It was a very strong shortlist very diverse as well. Did you read I, them all? I, no, I didn't read any of them. None of them. So that I could not be trapped by questions about them. You know, the thing is that um, y these decisions are difficult and they're usually very close. I've been a booker judge and I know all about the horse trading that goes on in the jury room. And I imagined if it came to, say, a 3-2 split, then my book would not win out. In fact, the jury conducted themselves in a completely different way this year. They discussed the merits of each book, and they arrived at a consensus, as the chairman said, and they didn't take a vote, which is a very grown-up way of going on. I was going to say, how mature. Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, and a very independent-minded jury as well, I think. Did you, um, you... You said that you knew from the first paragraph of this book that it was going to be the best thing you'd written. Did you really? From the first paragraph of Wolf Hall, the yes. predecessor. Yes, I had a feeling Sorry, of... Sorry, I meant of the job. Yes, the, I had a feeling of having come home and that this was the book I was meant to write. I mean, writing's a, an act of confidence, isn't it? So I wonder if um, winning two Booker Prizes in a row means that sitting in front of the blank page suddenly becomes incredibly easy. You just sort of sit there and go, <laughs> I'm a double Booker winner. 
do, you, do you have? I mean, you haven't had a chance to 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 try that out yet. But do you feel that it'll have an impact? No, I don't think so. I think that the blank pages or the blank screen is incredibly equalising. Every day is a new beginning, and every day you're just in the same position as a beginning writer. You could do it last night, but can you manage it this morning? You know, there's always that fear that. Well, you know, as I as I say to people, you're only as good as your next paragraph. Your last paragraph doesn't matter, and you have to negotiate each day quite freshly with your subject matter. So. It gives me confidence in the one way, a sort of overarching confidence, but it doesn't change things from day to day. It doesn't make it easier, but it doesn't make it harder either. So, what was it about Thomas Cromwell that convinced you that he was the man you wanted to spend a decade of your life with? No offence to your husband. <laughs> Oh, I've spent uh, four decades with my husband, so, so this is just he a doesn't rest mind. With Cromwell. <laughs> uh, well, the thing is with Thomas Cromwell. Big question here. It's good to go into a book with one enormous question, and my question about Cromwell was: blacksmith's son from Putney rises to be the king's right-hand man. Minister of Everything and Earl of Essex. How? And that's the question that drives the whole book. Let me um, just briefly set the scene in terms of the plot for, for Bring Up the Bodies. Um, by 1535, Thomas Cromwell, the blacksmith's son, is far from his humble origins. He's chief minister to Henry VIII. His fortunes have risen with those of Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife, for whose sake Henry has broken with Rome and created his own church. I don't know why I'm telling you all this, because I'm pretty sure you know it already. Anyway, Henry's actions have forced England into rather dangerous isolation, and Anne has failed to do what she promised, which was a bearer son to secure the Tudor line. Um, in Bring Up the Bodies, the sequel to the Man Booker Prize winning Wolf Hall, Hillary explores one of the most mystifying and frightening episodes, really, in, in English history, the destruction of Anne Boleyn. This new novel is a speaking picture, an audacious vision of Tudor England that sheds light on the modern world. It's the work of one of our great authors at the height of her powers, as was proven uh, on Tuesday night. How has... Cromwell changed uh, through the passage of these two books. I mean, in, in the first book, he was virtually a matinee idol. I fell completely in love with him. He's this sophisticated, well-traveled, liberal-minded to an extent, an intellectual. Um, but it, as, he, as, as we approach Bring Up the Bodies, the, there seem to be darker forces working with him, and he becomes more enthralled to the king's demands. The political situation is changing all the time. And behind the political situation, you've got a huge crisis in the making. England's having a run of bad harvests. There isn't enough grain to go around. To get grain, we need the emperor, Charles V, to keep the shipping routes open and export to England. Charles V can, if he wishes, blockade England. He can cut off the grain and all other supplies. Charles V is a nephew of Catherine of Aragon and uh, Henry's discarded first wife. So we've got a political situation here where Cromwell has to somehow conciliate Catherine's nephew while at the same time living with the increasing power of Henry's second wife and the Boleyn family. And by the turn of the year, 1535, Anne Boleyn is becoming a political liability. It's clear that no country in Europe is actually going to recognize Henry's second marriage. And when Anne tries to negotiate a marriage for her little daughter with the French, uh, 
the French make the situation quite plain. They don't think the marriage is valid. They think the child is illegitimate. This is, by the way, the future Queen Elizabeth I. So Anne, if you like, no longer has currency. Uh, she has no currency diplomatically. She is a liability. And she's fallen out with Cromwell because the servant, that is Cromwell, is becoming big, um, bigger than the master, uh, than the Boleyn family. And she said to Cromwell, if Henry goes out of the country on a trip to France and leaves me as regent, you're dead. So we are in a situation which day by day the swords are being sharpened. The knives are being sharpened by Anne for Cromwell and in the background by Cromwell for Anne. Would you say that the biggest difference between uh, this book and its predecessor, Wolf Hall, is the sense of sort of building tension? They're very different books. Wolf Hall is a big capacious book which takes in a great time span and goes back even beyond history, into myths about the origin of England. Bring Up the Bodies, by contrast, covers only nine months. And they are the nine months between the royal party's arrival at Wolf Hall, when Henry falls in love with Jane Seymour, soon to be wife number three. Through that autumn, the turn of the year, and then straight like an arrow fired to a target to Anne's execution in May. So it's a book that gathers terrific energy and impetus, quite different in structure and feel from Wolf Hall. Was your intention uh, with this trilogy to rewrite history, to to take a different look at it? Or was that something that happened organically as you decided to engage with Tudor England? Well, I haven't rewritten history. My portrait of Cromwell is not the one we're used to. But there is a valid historical tradition behind my portrait of Cromwell. I haven't conjured it out of thin air. And that tradition stretches from Cromwell's own day through the centuries, through Shakespeare, through John Fox's Book of Martyrs, right up to Sir Geoffrey Elton, the great Tudor historian working in the 60s and 70s, excavating Thomas Cromwell from the historical record and establishing him as the central figure in the power politics of the 1530s. So I have, um, there's a turn of the wheel, reputations rise and fall, and I am just reassisting Cromwell's ascent. But the jury is still out, isn't it, as to whether he was the man who pushed Henry or Henry was the man who pushed Cromwell. Have you come to conclusions? Well, certainly in this particular matter, the fall of Anne Boleyn, the whole thing is ambiguous. There, there are some historians who will maintain, actually, Henry was responsible. Cromwell did as he was told. And there are others who see Cromwell as the orchestrator of a complex conspiracy involving the people who should have been his natural opponents, the old aristocratic families, the papists, the supporters of Princess Mary, pulling them together in an anti-Berlin front and mounting a coup d'etat. Now, people have said to me, uh, you've been too sympathetic to Cromwell, uh, you... You should be blaming him more. You should be judging him more. You should be moralizing him about, about him more. But actually, it would be perfectly possible to make a, a story about the fall of Anne Boleyn in which Cromwell is exonerated and you could 
adduced perfectly respectable evidence to back that version. That's not what I have chosen. I have chosen something far, far more ambiguous that shows the responsibility of all parties interwoven and also considers the Berlin's part in their own downfall. So I write not to exonerate Cromwell, but to examine an affair which by its nature is off the record. A conspiracy does not leave a paper trail. So we are working essentially below the eye line of historians. We are working uh, uh, with negotiations that take place face to face, stuff that's off the record, whispers behind the hand, and the power of rumor. And Every line, I think, seethes with ambiguity and double meaning. If, before we move on to the, the next reading, I mean, for, for some people, for quite a number of people, I imagine, this will be their first introduction to these characters. I mean, aside from Henry VIII, obviously, you know. Uh, does it matter, you know, because there's the whole discussion about fiction versus history and historical fiction and the veracity of it and so on. Does it matter to your mind? Where, where, what do you think that the, the, the actual discussion should be about? I think you can easily set up a false opposition. Historians versus novelists shouldn't be like that. What I do doesn't add to the historian's version. It doesn't detract from it. It runs alongside it. It's a different discipline. What I deal with is those matters, which, as I say, are below the historian's eye line. The, the novelist is used to an intensive process of imagining the inner lives of other people. And this is what you bring to the novel. What you also bring is you work away in the gaps, you work away at the erasures. And sometimes, because you are free, as it were, from the cause and effect mentality of historians, you can have sudden insights because you can um, admit to your version the role of chance, of accident, randomness, which does play a part in human affairs. You are not obliged to be as tidy narratively as a historian. And I think that what you can also do is simply this. The historian tells you what happened, and the novelist makes a shrewd guess at what it might have felt like while it was happening. <laughs> um, yeah. You make 1536 and Tudor England come alive in a way that I, I don't think I've experienced in terms of, you know, and, and it's a period that's, that's been incredibly well documented. So what's your trick? How do you do it? I mean, obviously, dispensing with any of the kind of archaic language and so on helps a lot, but there's something absolutely visceral and tangible about your descriptions of particularly the, the city and the food and the, I mean, everything. I think it's um, casting your net wide in research terms. It, it, it's not enough to stick with the politics. It's not enough to read official documents. What, what you have to do is you have to find the hinterland. Um, Sometimes it's looking at pictures, it's listening to music, it's recreating their total world, uh, imagining yourself back into a world where maybe the loudest sound a person ever heard was a peal of thunder. Um, a world... Do you know, people always say, oh, God, everything must have been so dirty in those times, the world must have stunk. But imagine a world without heavy industry. Imagine a world without pollution, where you could walk out in the morning into your garden and you could smell the flowers. Uh, it's a horrific world, but it's also a more innocent world 
in many ways. And I think, I think it's really about creating the total picture so that you are there, not just through your intellect, but through your senses as well. How much do you have to cut yourself, as the writer, how much do you have to cut yourself off from the world you're, you're presently living in? I mean, do you have to be pretty brutal about, you know, the lack of intrusion and the ability to just be? Well, you know, you can't, you can't live in the 16th century. You've, um, you have to negotiate with the world. It's, it's a trick. What it is, it's retaining two realities in your head at the same time. So when I walk around London, when I was writing about the 18th century, it used to be that I walked around in 21st century London and in the 1780s. And now I walk around in the 21st century and the 1530s. It's funny that you should say walk around because that's the other thing that's incredibly striking about both the books that you've published so far in this trilogy is this sense of forward momentum. I mean, I know that you said that Wolf Hall covered a long, much, much longer period, but it still had that pacing to it that appears again in Bring Up the Bodies where you feel that you're walking with Cromwell, you're walking the streets, you're restless, you're relentless, the whispering is happening as you walk by. It, it's a book about crisis it's it's heading towards regime change coup d'etat uh, and decisions must be taken instantly and i think what cromwell did when he had to manage this affair of bringing down the berlins he knew what he was trying to achieve but he didn't know how he was going to do it it was the most amazing exhibition of brinksmanship and it was a question of, we'll talk to this person, we'll talk to that person, we'll see what the rumours are, we'll see what the gossip is, we will listen hard, we'll see what we can make of it. Torture is not a factor. People assume it is. The Tudors weren't forever torturing each other. Torture was illegal in England. It did go on. But I don't think it was a factor in this case. What Cromwell did is he arrested Anne, or rather, Thomas he stood Cromwell. back and the council proceeded against her with Henry's direct sanction. And when Anne was in the tower, terribly frightened, terribly confused, she began trying to make sense of her situation. So she began talking back through recent days. Think, he said to me, and I said to him, and as she talked and talked, she provided all the material to condemn her. And everything she said was recorded it was written down, it was handed to Cromwell a matter of an hour later. And so the case was built against Anne and five men who were alleged to be her lovers. You said, um, you said this week, in fact, that in some ways you felt that Cromwell lived in more enlightened times and that his poor law was, uh, you know, incredibly advanced thinking. Can you elaborate on that statement? Cromwell was a, a, a radical thinker. In, in, in the mid-1530s, he tried to put a poor law measure through Parliament, which was revolutionary because, for the first time, someone in power was recognising that an economic system may have casualties and that poverty is not ordained by God or a moral failing you may simply have fallen on the wrong side of the system because unemployment was a great problem in Tudor England. This was because of the booming wool trade, uh, which had turned land over to sheep rather than agrarian uses. It takes far fewer people to keep sheep than it does to work the land. So there was a huge problem of unskilled people without work. Cromwell thought it might be the state's duty 
to do something about this. And he came up with a plan for building an infrastructure for England, roads, bridges, harbours, forts, paying the people, giving them medical care and housing while they were working. To do this, he proposed to levy an income tax. Uh, Parliament simply stared him out, stony-faced, and said no. The king was for the measure. He kept trying to sneak it back in. But that was only one of his radical plans. Uh, he was at the centre of a group of men who, um, you know, for, for the time we're talking about, were astonishingly innovative in the way they thought. And it really is one of the things about him that commands your respect, because he's a revolutionary with no revolutionary tradition to call on. Uh, but, but going back to the poor law and this sort of idea of enlightenment, uh, you feel that the situation is very different today, that, that being poor is seen as something that people have willed upon themselves. Yeah, I mean, we're, go we're going back to a situation uh, that even Thomas Cromwell would have recognised as unenlightened, where, once again, poverty is being seen as um, a moral failing, People are feckless. Um, the unemployed are um, scroungers. I mean, the rhetoric is horrible. It's unbearable. And you're going back to a situation where instead of talking about people's rights, uh, benefits and state support is being presented as a privilege, which means it can be withdrawn. And once again, uh, the rich are telling the poor how many children to have, etc. Is that one of the fascinating things about writing history? Not just that you can see the patterns before the events that you're describing, but that you can bring them right up to the present day? Yes, but I don't like to force contemporary parallels, because they were like us in some ways, but the great fascination is the way in which they were unlike us. And I do really think that past is of value for its own sake. Um, now, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Would anyone like to start? Follow that gruesome passage. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, do you already know, and have you mapped out the complete trilogy? Like, do you know what the next book is? You know, like, have you started mapping it out, penning anything? Or is it kind of something you think about once you've digested the second book a bit further? I don't know. No, I, I, I've got a lot of material. Um, I've done a lot of forward planning for the first, for the third book. It's, um, it's better not to plan in too much detail, though. I find it's better to work from a general outline, but then scene by scene, as I approach every individual scene, then to gather all my facts and figures all my notes, all my ideas, all my images, and go through them again, and then plunge into writing the scene. It's almost like stepping onto a stage. Each one is a performance, each one is a drama. And you can't really plan that in advance. You want to have, you know, we know, as writer and reader, we know what's going to happen. The characters do not know. So all the time you are trying to admit into your book at least the appearance of spontaneity, of dynamism, of events moving fast. And I find that too much planning, and it's true of all fiction, not just historical fiction, it puts a kind of dead hand on the endeavour. We've got time for one, maybe two more questions. The gentleman at the back there, just by that pillar. Thank you. It, it follows on from that question in a way. I'm intrigued, if you're dealing with an historical novel, clearly, as you've stated, you have the framework, it's in place. Does it ever take you off in unexpected directions once you're into the book? Oh, yes, all the time. Um, when I started off on this Thomas Cromwell project, it was to write one book... But as I got into the material, then I saw its richness. And month by month, as I, as I read, as I researched, 
the complexity uh, struck me and the whole possibilities of the project opened out before me. So it is, I think, an intensely creative proje uh, project, writing historical fiction. Though you have the guidelines, it's often at the last moment, as you go right into a scene, and then you see the connections. You have a sudden insight. There may be words that have been puzzling people down the centuries, and suddenly you sneak up on it, as it were, and you say, oh, I get it now. I know what that means. Well, we know where the story ends, yes. Hilary. How do you feel about killing him off eventually, your man, your Cromwell? Well, the next book isn't the fall of Thomas Cromwell. It, it takes place over four years, so it's the rise and rise and rise of Cromwell. To the spring of 1540, April is a huge crisis. Everyone thinks Cromwell is finished, but he has the knack of springing back to his feet. Are you saying Henry, there's going to be four books no, now? No, no, <laughs> Henry Which makes years. Henry makes him an earl. Weeks later, he's arrested. He's in the tower. He never comes out. No, I see the pattern, but I just want to disabuse people of the notion that the next book is... All doom and gloom. Uh, an awful sort of chronicle of misery and decline. Far from it, uh, quite early in the new book, Cromwell saying to his servant Christoph, where's my orange coat? I used to have an orange coat. Get it out. We're springing into a brave new world. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Hilary Mantel. Thank you.